Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. My name is Tana Dawkin, Chief Data Privacy Officer for the World Bank. I will moderate the session, and we will be engaging in a discussion with our featured speaker, as well as managing the questions we've received from our attendees ahead of time. This session of our two-day Data Privacy Day event is a special one, a spoken word performance and follow-up discussion with our wonderful featured performer and winner of America's Got Talent 2020, Brandon Luke. In addition to being a talented artist, Mr. Luke is also the founder and CEO of an organization called Called to Move. To deliver closing remarks, we have Mr. Ethiopis Tafara, Vice President and Chief Risk Legal Ad Administrative Officer at MEGA. Finally, we are also honored to have Sandy Okoro, Senior Vice President and General Counsel for the World Bank Group and Vice President of Compliance to the World Bank. Sandy will give opening remarks. Sandy is a strong champion and advocate for the World Bank Group's data privacy agenda, and we are thrilled to have you here with us. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Tammy. And as uh, let me repeat, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you wherever you are. And Tammy, thank you so much and to all of your team for uh, this effort in highlighting the importance of data privacy. The World Bank Group has formed a task force on racism to examine various internal and external workings of the institution and its intersectionality with race and ethnicity. We appreciate that meaningful change, real change, can only happen if culture and behaviours change too. When it comes to data privacy, the questions arise, what does data privacy have to do with race, racism, or racial discrimination? I would venture to say that data privacy has a lot to do with race because appropriate data can help us in understanding trends, can illustrate patterns in de demographics, and we can also rely on it as a predictor for potential outcomes. So data is important. And it is true to say that the fear exists that if misused, racial and ethnic data could also be used for racial profiling, something that scares all of us without a doubt. In terms of data privacy, what we see is that either people provide too much information about themselves or not enough. In fact, here at the World Bank, we are seeing that um, very problem in that people aren't providing enough data so we can do uh, trend analysis on race. So what lends itself to the debate is how much does one disclose without compromising privacy and still balance it with, a, with helping the community and society in having robust data. A real balance to be struck there and a lot of food for thought. On this, we are going to get into a really interesting discussion with our guest of honour, who is a poet, not just a poet, but a powerhouse of a poet whose words encapsulate experiences and resonate with justice and truth. So it is my great pleasure and honour to welcome the winner of America's Got Talent 2020, the great Brandon Leake. We are so delighted to have him with us here today. And let me just say, hello. This, uh, Brandon, it's wonderful to have you with us. And let me just say that this wonderful artistic performance by Brandon does include a narration of a racist incident that happened to him. He uses the explicit words that were used to him. It contains some swearing and a nasty racial epithet. So you may feel as comfortable and uncomfortable as he was made to feel too. But this is a powerful piece and I hope you enjoy it. Brandon, over to you. Hello everyone. My name is Brandon Leak. I am a spoken word artist out of Stockton, California, in particular Southside Stockton. That's my home. I'm born and raised here. Um, and I'm a husband, a father, a son, brother, Christian, 
Um, but what I'm most prominently known for uh, as of right now is being the winner of season 15 of America's Got Talent. And the thing that I do is I share poetry spoken word to be particular and today what you will be receiving from me are several different pieces in which are navigating this tightrope of a journey of societal injustice um, and inevitably leading itself towards um, reconciliation and healing um, we as a country have not yet gotten there but I have good faith to believe that we can. So I, I feel the best way for me to introduce this time um, is actually with a poem entitled Steps so you all can get to know me a little bit. So here we go. Steps to being Brandon Leak. One, you, you gotta first be named Brandon Leak. Two, be born on May 4th, 1992 with an extremely large head. Um, sorry about that, mom. Three, be born to a mother who got a heart of gold and just pray that she also got that Midas touch for. Be born and raised here in Southside Stockton in a cave full of hard rocks that when pressed become gems. Five. Be born with brown skin. The successive amount of melanin will surely dictate much of your future. Be sure to remember these steps. Six. Be born with all of your limbs and then remove one. My fault. No. Remove your father. No surprises here. Refer back to step five. Seven. Have abandonment issues. These will surely rear their ugly heads later. Eight, cling to your mother. She's the only form of consistency that you have ever known. Be sure to push all other men in her life away so she does not leave you just like he did. Refer back to step six, nine, go to go to middle school and uh, get yourself a girlfriend, Brandon. Uh, 10, you know that girl that we was just talking about like five seconds ago? Um, you see that, that didn't quite work out. So uh, go ahead, Brandon, hand out your heart to girls in a desperate attempt to avoid this painful agony that we call loneliness. Refer back to step seven, 11, repeat step 10 continuously. 12, pray for brighter days because they cast large shadows for your fears to hide in. 13, wear a mask because they'll make you far more tolerable to the world. 14, don't forget to have a real complicated relationship with your stepfather. Argue with him repeatedly until these twists become your only form of expression. 15, buck up little boy, I thought I told you real men don't got depression. 16. Dream of doing what no one in your family has ever done before and then go do it. 17, go off to college and then try to reinvent yourself to be the cool guy you always dreamed of being when you was in high school. Way before I had all these bills. 18, understand that there is no escaping reality. You are who you always have been, no matter the location. 19, face on this, but you see, Brandon, you're just not... You're not ready for that burden yet, bro. So let's try that again. 19, face loneliness. But you see, Brandon, you're just not strong enough for that journey yet, bro. So I, I guess the easier way to express this to y'all be like this. See, when I was four years old, my eight and a half month old sister, Danielle Marie Gibson, she died in the car next to me due to heart failure. So death isn't something I really adopted, but more so grew myself into. And I can't help but think that my roots still lie six feet deep alongside her. And then my grandfather, the only father figure I've ever known, uh, uh, my my senior year of my senior year of high school, he he drowned. No, my fault. He he died due to lung and liver cancer, rushing to a hospital next to his wife of fifty years in a graduation ceremony with only one seat left empty, never left Lee feeling so numb inside. And then my best friend, my my brother Bernard Daniels, he he drowned in a levee two blocks behind my old neighborhood, running away from a rival gang during my freshman year of college, and I was two hundred miles too far north to embrace his body before it ever turn cold before you ever stop breathing before you ever never returned home again 20 i wake up most mornings just to look myself in this mirror and i see a reflection of a stranger this guy who i know resides inside but i'm too afraid i'm too scared and i'm far too fearful to finally unzip myself from my own skin to allow this world to see me uncovered Nothing but dry bones, raw meat, and a barren soul just for the world to respond back saying, Hey, yo, Brandon, man, we appreciate your transparency and everything, but to us, dog, don't even stress. You're just not going to be good enough. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. There's no more steps, just tons of questions like, Who's Brandon Leak? 
Anyways. So like, I, I like to lead off with that piece. And, and one of the biggest reasons why I enjoy leading off with a piece like that is because it, it gives a framework for you all to understand my journey. And, and as this journey continues, as, as I share more of these poems, what inevitably ends up happening is people, people end up, you know, drafting and making their own assumptions about people. They see them have success and they'll ask like, yo, did they have a hard life? Did they have an easy life? Like, what were the circumstances of their upbringing? Who was around them? Like, where did they grow up at? And I, I know for a fact, it's it's a really interesting thing when people hear Stockton, I, I know all the stereotypes that they hear. And if I'm being honest, I, I'll share with you who I am and where I'm from. So I, I guess I just showed you who I am. Let me show you where I'm from because, hello everybody, my name is Brandon Leak and I'll be your tour guide today through Six and Nightingale, our little hood oasis. Please be sure not to stray too far away from the group for we are not liable for your safety. I feel it's only fitting that we start this tour properly poolside, or should I say pools side, because here at Six and Nightingale, we believe in options. And I know what you may be wondering. Why are all these pools discolored? Astute observation, my friend. You see, here at Six and Nightingale, we believe in providing our residents with only the finest of inebriation. So go ahead and take your pick, whether it be vodka, gin, malt, liquor, tonic, whatever your heart desires to escape. We will provide for you, but you with the pajama pants on, you had a question. Oh, you want fresh, clean water. <laughs> Man, you see, you know, that's the good stuff. That'll cost you. For someone in your financial position, it'd be much more cost effective for you to simply get a pool full of cheap liquor and then dive in it. But anyway, on to our next display. Here, we have our cafeteria. Our employees receive calories and salaries. They got all the snacks, chips, candy, soda a person could ever want. And if that doesn't satisfy your needs, no need to fret. We have our never-ending dollar menu and top ramen cuisine, which is sure to hit that palate of yours just right. But... I'm sorry, you all, this tour will continue, but we have another question. Oh, you want fresh fruits and vegetables? <laughs> and meat, too. Gosh, dang, how cute. See, uh, I, I think you may have us mistaken with our location just a tad bit farther up north from here. But you see, this tour must go on. To our left, we have our local community resource center. It's oftentimes empty due to risk of injury from fellow residents. But to our right, we also have our local com community resource center. The, the second one? I, I thought we already had one of those. But you see, it's oftentimes also empty due to the fact that people don't trust who or what lies inside. But here, we have our crown jewel of them all, our, our brand new school. Here, your students will receive a quality education. We'll give them experienced teachers who are so burnt out by the problems that we don't help them out with that they don't really care no more. But we'll give them books and computers, but not the necessary education requirements for them to be able to attend college. Because, I mean, who would want to leave this beautiful place anyway? I mean, here, we built such a, self, we built such a self-sufficient system that we rarely have any vacancies, so no one ever really leaves. They just continue to refuel our machine. My fault. Um... That's not in the brochure. You see, you see here, it, it reads that they continue to re-inhabit our communities. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, but uh, unfortunately, at, at this moment, well, first of all, welcome to Six and Nightingale. But unfortunately, at this moment, we, we don't really have any vacancies. Do, 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 do. Hey, calm down, calm down. This is actually really good news. See, we, we had a young black boy who just got gunned down by the police. It's a reenactment of uh, 2019, 18, 17, 16, 15. But you know what I mean. Uh, but now, since he's gone, it appears now that we also have a vacancy. So would you like to move in now or maybe later? And see, I... Uh, I do that poem in such a sarcastic tone because it, it's an odd thing. Growing up where I'm from and where many people are from who look like me, that we, we are raised in neighborhoods with, that are food deserts, that have low income, so our schools don't get all the resources they need. Um, industry doesn't come to our neighborhoods, but we have alcohol, drugs, over-policing, and lack of access to pretty much all fundamental needs to help improve one's life. And then people ask why we'd be self-destructive. And it wasn't until I became older that I began to realize, I'm like, man, we really do exist in this powder keg that will, will really blow up in our faces 
due to the fact that people don't really understand that what we're doing isn't working. And and I know one of the biggest things that people have asked during the course of this time as mental health has become significantly greater on the mind's eye of the world is, yo, know, like, like black people, how come you guys don't seem to take mental health as seriously as, as other people do? And I, I think, um, I think one of the reasons for that is due to the fact that we are still dealing with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, the fact of the matter is we're out here just simply trying to survive. And one of those moments of, one of those moments of survival I, I dealt with in my own personal life. I remember I had pulled over to a gas station and I went inside to go get some food and some gas. I had already pumped my gas, went back to go get the food that I had ordered that was getting cooked, came back out. And there's a gentleman in this huge truck standing behind me. And what ended up happening was, as he saw me come out with my food, he said, no effing way, no effing way, you fucking nigger, you fucking nigger. And then he reached into his car and he grabbed a gun. Me spooked, stood still. He stares at me, throws the gun back in the car and says, you're not worth the ammunition, and then drives off. And I remember hopping back into my car, calling my mom. And the first thing that she told me after I finished sharing the story was, Pookie, I didn't even know that you made it. Because when I'm up here on stage, they call me Brandon. When I'm with my homies, they call me B. And when I'm with the ladies, let's just say, they call me Taken because I'm already aptly spoken for. But when I'm at home, my mama, my mama and my mama alone call me Pookie. And no, I'm not afraid to admit it. My mother calls me Pookie at like the most inopportune moments. For instance, today on my way here to get ready to, you know, do this whole thing with y'all at World Bank, my mama made sure to call me on the phone and said, make sure that you call me when you get there. Even if it's only virtually. Pookie. And like, I get why my mama said it out of courtesy, but to be real, I don't understand why my mom's so concerned for my safety and praying for me as I leave her house on a daily, because I'm just a young black man who got faith in Jesus the same way that stars have faith that space will protect them from this galactic bully that we call gravity, who longs to turn their star to a splendid spectacle for passerbyers to watch in awe of its death. So yes, I never really understood the issue. And, and then I went on Facebook. And I realized that my mama loved me the same way every mother loved their son. Fearfully. Because normally, death don't really bother me. I mean, I'm from Southside Stockton. I'm all too familiar with how some family reunions only ever take place on graveyard grass and how a hole can be a safe haven for a soul in this mortal game of hide and go seek. But you see, there's something so different about Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd. Breonna Taylor, and the countless others. And as I stared at that screen, I couldn't help but think I was looking at a mirror image of myself being choked out or gunned down for merely breathing or for daring to be more than three-fifths of what them folk thought them to be. Or maybe it was simply due to their hue and how this melanin skin could absorb the sun but can't stand the rain. And in that moment, I better understood my black mother's greatest fear was that every time I leave a home on the other side of this phone will no longer be a sun but be America's next most popular hashtag accompanied by a video of her young star being gunned down by gravity as my star this has turned splendid spectacle for passerbyers to watch in awe of my death so yes my mother's greatest fear is I won't return home breathing blood pulsing through these veins enough to still be her pookie and my mama warn me son don't you dare get caught at that wrong place at that wrong time with that wrong colored skin because those three strikes they lead the pine box convictions and i need you to return home my pookie again so dear mom i promise you this i will do everything in my power to make it back home to you 
But if I don't, just know you are the very last thing on my mind. And I will always, always be your The issues that everyone faces in this world are not absentee in my community. In fact, they're heightened due to the fact that there is so much need, yet so little understanding of how to provide it. And that's why I look at our nation as a true beacon of hope for what we can be, because if we finally begin to abandon this melting pot ideology, this idea that we have to all assimilate into this one thing in order for it to be beautiful, I, I think in fact it's the opposite. I think instead of looking at ourselves as a melting pot, but instead beginning to view ourselves as a mosaic, a, a beautiful piece of art that has all of these independently shiny different bits and pieces, different colors that are representative of our different cultures, our, our different heritage, our different religions, ethnicities, genders, identities, all of these different things that come together. I, I, I genuinely do believe that we can be a beautiful, a beautiful spotlight for the world to see just what it's like when, when unity is, is, is on the forefront. When, when loving one another is, is not only the mission, but the objective and, and one in which we go out and go do on a daily basis. And, and with that in mind, I have a poem I'd like to read to you all entitled Mosaic. There is no progression without recognition of the road we've traveled. The price of independence is great been paid in trails of tears, dreams caught in nightmare snare as a case of mistaken identity led to genocide via biological warfare. And the remnants of a culture turned their red skin pale while their lives spilled scarlet streams, silent screams sirened through these mountains. Its echo grows faint while Mother Earth mourns the loss of her children. Trailblazing further west led to the eradication of our brown skin kin drowned in a sea of bullets in the middle of a desert while Americans marched to battle singing songs of this land is our land this land is my land from California to the New York Island while 25,000 laid to rest on land in which they once called home in which their predecessors would be deemed aliens on all the while this manifest destiny transpired stage coaches voyaged along that old Oregon trail with smiling families carrying melanin coated property white children frolicked arms unfurled around plantations while black children's arms unfurled as they were stripped from their mothers white women prepared meals for their husbands Julian the potatoes tenderize the steak add salt and pepper to season it just right next prepare the fire for cooking while black women watch as their husbands are prepared for sacrifice Julian the kindling pulverizes body kerosene will season him just right next prepare the fire for burning this this is the foundation of the American dream that turned horrendous reality where unjust justicisms further propagate the destruction of the disenfranchised through lack of resources and education, which leads to increased crime rates and depression, self-medication through narcotic and liquid inebriation. The media stream this perception to the masses, create propaganda-based sphere to justify militarized policing in these racially and socioeconomically segregated ghettos is that enough of a history lesson for us to finally get the message because the old way wasn't working so it's on us to do what we gotta do to not only survive but thrive because 
Survival is no longer the key for I want to live in the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness because that's what's been robbed for me by this lack of equality. I got my hands up. Can we cease fire so we can think a plan up? That's my desire. So we can stop this system of oppression from functioning so normally because the depravity of humanity been weighing your boy down like gravity. But I still got faith that this won't remain the case that we can all be the peace that we desire to see so we won't have to celebrate a rose that grew from concrete because it would have been planted in fertile soil from the beginning for we have never been a melting pot and never should strive to be but instead come to terms with the mosaic we are a wide array of colors and cultures with unique histories that need not be assimilated in uniformity but instead admired and understood for the only way we ever gonna make it to the other side of this pain is if we do it together for the brightness of your hue does not diminish the shine of my own the only limits of this truth are the ones in which we place on it because the truth of the matter is, it is not our light, but our, it is not our light. <sighs> it is not our darkness, but our light that most frightens us. But as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people the freedom to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. So take my words as lyrical liberation. They paint the sky with all the colors of my soul. I see the beauty God placed in you. So come paint the skies with me too. There's so much canvas to go around. Can't wait to meet you up there. Sorry for that mess up in the middle, y'all. Um, <laughs> but at, as, as I'm talking about this idea of this mosaic, it's it's that that final portion of the piece is is what's like so beautiful to me is recognizing that like we we live in a world of so much vast opportunity so much vast opportunity for us to be able to not only create a better world but but to be able to to do it in in immediacy that that we can that we can finally begin to meld the, the 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 patience and wherewithal of our former generations and and the urgency and the immediacy of now like i that that's the ultimate pairing that i see is as i look at people like as I, as I look at people like James Baldwin, like like Malcolm X, like Martin Luther King Jr., like Marcus Garvey, like these individuals, I, I, I look at them and I say, you know what, they, they, they had something here and here that allowed them to understand that patience was a virtue that was needed in this fight and in this battle. And they operated, though, as if change would come tomorrow. And I think that if we can pair that with the immediacy that we have and hold today for change to come now in our, in our global reach to be able to create impact and change. I know that we can get it done without a doubt in my mind. And, and as I think about the idea of like looking up at the stars, looking up at the sky, it, it reminds me of the fact that all of these people, all of the people in the world who have ever changed it, in any type of positive fashion, first originated as dreamers. And this final piece I have for you is for the dreamers. <sighs> Hello everybody, my name is Brandon Leak and I've come to a very startling conclusion. Are you ready for it? Yes, you, I'm, I'm talking to you. Are you ready for it? Okay, yes. Uh, you see, I, Brandon Leak, am a freaking fool. And I know what some of y'all out there are thinking, hey, yo, Brandon, dog, you've been like yelling at us through your computer screen for like the past like 27 minutes. We already knew that, dog. Keep up. But you see, I, 
I wouldn't consider myself to be a fool. At least half the time, because I do know I have my foolish moments, times which I seem like a five-year-old kid who's just running around the playground. Moments in which my youthful exuberance reaches out of me like tree branches full of life, just longing to stretch out as far as they can. But I'd also consider myself a very mature young man who's grounded in my convictions, deeply rooted into soil, and which I've laid claim to as my home. So no, I would not consider myself to be nobody's fool. However, this world would and does. And for the longest time, I've been trying to figure out why. Like, why am I such a fool? Is it, is it the way that I walk? And the way that I talk to the fact that I have something in my teeth, and you tell me if I have something in my teeth? Didn't nobody tell me? Man, y'all messed up. See, see, but I, I think I understand now the reason why this world does call me a fool. I think the world calls me a fool because I'm a dreamer. My mind is a galaxy, and I am an astronaut. Untethered. Free floating across it, taking with me the memory of every beautiful thing that I see. Because when I dream, I dream real big, y'all. I mean, I dream solar systems. I dream planets of ambition, moons of motivation, far stars to illuminate all these dark scars. Because when I dream, I dream real big, y'all. Sometimes too big. You see, this, this world, it likes to remind me, hey, yo, young man, yes, we want you to go out there and dream. But please, dial that down a little bit, okay? Because understand that that galaxy was meant for you to see, not touch. Don't forget that you come from a people group that was considered to be too savage to be fully human. So we made you three fifths they equal. Don't forget that you come from a neighborhood where you're more likely to have a baby at the age of 22 than you are a college degree. Don't forget that you come from a family where addiction isn't a surprise, but an expectation. So young man. Yes, dear foolish young astronaut, we, we want you to journey out, but your oxygen tank wasn't made to embark on such a path. There's no guarantee you'll survive, so leave that journey up to the qualified. You see, you, you see this world, it told me, don't dream so big. And at first, I thought they did it to protect me from failure because I, I, I don't know, I, I really don't like the idea of, of failing. But, you know, I think now that... that, that I think now the, the reality of it is that the God in these dreams are too large for their small mindedness. I think that my voice is beginning to create anomalies in their constellations because me rewriting my legacy in the stars was never in their telescope of vision because I'm just longer for my shot, for my chance, for my opportunity to show the world that I am more than what they think because if you ever dreamed of being more than what they said you'd be, more than happenstance and calamities, sloppy wet kiss. Have y'all ever wished? Have y'all ever dreamed? Have y'all ever relived these childish moments where this world was such a beautiful place instead of witnessing it pass by through the eyes of subjugation? Because if this makes me a fool, then you know what? I'm going to be a fool 365, 366 on a leap year, 24 7. Because on the other side of that sea of stars lies my dreams, and I'm nothing but a little bit of hope, but a whole lot of motivation. So I guess it's time for me to unlatch and detach from this space enclosure so I can free flow roam space on bound because up there there's no ground to tread upon no marks to be left in the dirt just to hope that my inner light will be radiant enough to show how far i have come and sincerely how far god has brought me because this poem is meant for those who drink <sighs> so from a beginning of identity to inevitably discussing the problematic issues of my community to discussing a nationwide and worldwide solution base to the personal journey of dreaming what it can be. I hope that you guys rocked with it. I hope that these poems, <laughs> I hope that these poems were able to reach somebody and touch somebody today in a positive way. Um, and I, I sincerely thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was so much fun. So much fun. So thank y'all. And I appreciate y'all greatly. Wow, Brandon, that was phenomenal. Thank you so very much. Um, I have goosebumps. Um, I can't, uh, I can't wait to watch more of your performances. Um, but thank you very much for sharing this with us. Um, after your seminal performances on America's Got Talent, it's probably safe to say you've become a public figure. Do you feel like it's become more difficult for you to carve out a private space for yourself? 
Uh, no, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's been too difficult to carve out private space just because of the way I carried myself on the show. It, it's the same way I carry myself in everyday life. I, I don't treat myself as any different than the average citizen. I don't treat anybody else as the, if they're any lower or different than I am. I just continue to persist in being the person who I prided myself in being, who is a humble, loving servant. And in that regard, I get the chance to continue to be me everywhere I go. Oh, very nice. Um, on a broader level, what do you feel we lose when we lose our private spaces? What do you feel we, we're giving up when more and more of our lives are in the public eye? Oh man, I think, I think the unfortunate part of what gets lost is authenticity. Um, as people, you know, move more in the public eye and out of the private space because people long to be accepted. People long to be, um, to be loved and adorned. Um, and they want to be able to be seen as valued. And in our society nowadays, you know, if you don't fit a particular mold, And in that regard, I think that we have a lot of work to do in our public realm to be able to help people feel more comfortable in being their varied selves. So that way we don't have to all fit within this monolith, but instead that we can actually be who we desire to be and not just have to fit into this small mold. Sandy, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Brandon, in your in your piece, the love for your late sister, your mother and your daughter comes across so strongly. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit about what you think are the effects of race and racial discrimination within families and for families. You know, it's a, it's a very personal thing that we take home with us. What does that what does that mean for us? Yeah, I mean, I remember growing up and my grandmother would explicitly tell me on a consistent basis, Pookie, you got to understand, um, you have to be twice as good to get half as much. Um, and you've done nothing wrong. It's just the way our society functions. My grandmother um, was, a, was a black woman who grew up in rural uh, Southern Oklahoma. Um, and for those who may not know the proximity of that, that's in the South of, of the United <laughs> States. And she grew up in the back of the bus. She grew up drinking from colored fountains, uh, back of restaurants, um, and things to that nature. And to see the way that those types of pains have transferred from generation to generation isn't just in my family, though. That's also the same for the fact that there's somebody who has a grandparent who grew up on the other end of it, who grew up on the privileged side of it, who now passes down some of those very damaging and derogatory beliefs about people who look different than them. And so racism and within our families um, is a destructive thing that begins to rot people from the inside out. And it only will be cured through generational shifting of one and love for others. Thank you, thank you for that. And um, don't worry, I'm not gonna call you Pookie, but I do love the fact that we, you know, all of us have these nicknames that are very quiet in our families. But so thank you for sharing that. But um, yeah, <laughs> is that you? Is that you? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, yeah, this is actually so, the one I wore on the show. Oh, okay, okay. So that is worth a lot of money. Isn't it? One day that will be up for auction um, um, in, in some part of the Brandon Leak memorabilia at Christie's somewhere, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, tell us a bit about, you know, in, in, in the piece, you talk about how um, your mother would ask you to please let her know when you got to your destination, um, you know, when you were going out. Um, and, and that sounds like a very normal mother thing to say, but actually it has certain tones in relation to that about safety and the fear we have for our young black boys, etc. Because when they walk through out of that door, it's, it's not the same experience that uh, young white men face. And maybe you could tell us a bit 
about that and, and those kind of experiences? Because you talked about the destructive um, uh, elements of this. Can, can you tell us a bit about how it, you know, that, that you step out of your front door? Yeah. Uh, it's hard to explain. It's one of those things where when you're a part of the culture, it's instinctively understood and known about the dangers that you face when you walk outside of the door. Um, and the fact that there's a safety or perceived safety in being at home. I mean, we look at a case like Brianna Taylor and realize that, you know, and my mom was like, always that when you walk out of this home, that, that you say you love us before you go. Um, because you never want your final words with somebody to be something that you would regret. Um, and I think that there's a keen understanding for her to know that if I were to ever, if, if I were to ever leave the home and the last thing she said to me was something in which she would not want me to hear, um, that she would be devastated by that. And I remember getting that lesson at like five years old. And so it's, I don't necessarily know how to put that feeling or description into words. It's, it's really just one of those things where, um, the threats upon and we have to perceive, understand that we're not promised tomorrow. And whenever we walk out the door, let's make sure that we leave wherever we were just at in love. Mm. Very, 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 we're not promised tomorrow, that's where, so leave in love. I think that's a lesson I need to learn um, as well, and I, I'll take that with me. Um, now, you said, you know, you don't want to be uh, just another, another hashtag, um, but young people use social media a lot. I have, I have a young son, he's a teenager, he's 19, and it, he's never far away from his phone. In fact, I think it's probably glued to his, 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 the palm of his hand. Um, but what advice would you have for young people about the use of social media and, and, and ensuring that, you know, they, there are some boundaries and, and, and make sure you maintain you know, your privacy um, as well? What, what would you say to the young people out there today when it comes to social media? <laughs> yeah, when it even beyond just social media, just technological advancements in general, um, be discerning in your utilization of it. It is not all of what defines you, um, but it is a tool to be utilized for the sake of the greater good and entertainment. I mean, like YouTube is fun, like you're watching Netflix and Hulu, all that stuff entertaining, being able to see your home homeboy or homegirls like this photo or video or whatever, all that stuff is really cool to see. Um, but especially when we start talking about social justice, um, make sure you're discerning, do your Google research and, and check with multiple valid resources before you share something. Because we've seen, especially over the course here in the States in particular, over the course of the past four years, the damaging effect of misinformation and the utilization of it to be able to propagate and push particular agendas. To voice that is real, that be able to hear through and say, oh, they're knowledgeable and not just opinionated. Because there's, you can be opinionated and not be knowledgeable make sure that you're the combination of the both. Knowledge is so important, right? And, and the internet has given us the ability to access knowledge in a way that um, brings some equality if you do have the access to the internet and, and we can have that equality of, 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 of you know, trying to make our there's there's a lot of false news out there as well, but we can we can be more discerning, I think, in that way. Now, since you won America's Got Talent, you've got lots of friend um, fans and friends across the world. I'm sure that the that the internet and you've been that, that have been exposed to you through the internet as well. Do you see what sort of things are you hearing from your international friends across different? countries and, and and what sort of parallels are there that you can see because we, we we're very global as a world now because of uh, the internet and social media what what have you seen there what parallels uh, can you draw from people from different countries who are your fans 
Oh yeah. Um, even, even beyond just the fandom being able to travel a bit before all of this happened. Like I remember going to New Zealand and getting the opportunity to, to meet some of the Aboriginal Maori people and to hear about, um, some of the struggles in which they've dealt with in terms of representation within their academic settings. Right. Um, like I remember the first time I ever really had any type of formal education about African history outside of like the brief moments of like learning about the pyramids of Egypt. Same thing happens to them where you only learn about your if you go seek higher education or go to university. Um, when I went to Canada, that same issue pervaded for their Native American people, their Native people to that country um, who are now being ostracized in that same fashion. Um, but also, um, one of the most beautiful things too about it is the, the disenfranchisement that they faced has in, simil has in kind also brought them together in this fight for change the same way that we see here in the States, which is an extremely beautiful thing. Um, and so those parallels are of course easy to see. Um, some other parallels uh, that I see that I'm extremely envious of. Uh, I have some friends in Ethiopia and uh, I be seeing some of the food that they make and I really just be wanting a bowl or a plate so that way I can have some of them in my house because I don't have access to some of those things. Well, you know, food does draw people together, doesn't it? It, it, it really is something that we all, we all bring our own cultures and with that comes our own sort of food traditions as well to the table. And that's one of the things that levels, I think, um, everybody. Before I hand over to Tammy, who's going to take you through some questions that we've got from our, our audience. Um, just I have one question of my own. Um, the arts really bring people together. They kind of hold a mirror up to society. They tell you things in a way that cannot be said in any other way. Can you just say, you know, very briefly, because I'm fascinated when I've seen your work, how you were drawn to the art. It takes a lot of guts to decide that is what you're going to do. How did you within yourself know that you were an artist? I would probably say the moment I realized I was a I was an artist was in my younger days as a as a drawer. I used to go walk down the street from my South Side house um, into this place called the Maya Angelou Library, and I would go check out and rent um, these Dragon Ball Z manga comics, and I'd get trace paper and I would trace the characters and have a super good time being able to like draw out my favorite cartoon show. Um, and then from there, I, I started drawing them on my own. And then I started writing the storylines for them. And then I kind of stopped drawing because I wasn't as good as it as I hoped I would be. And then I really started focusing on the writing. Um, and then in high school, I kept writing poetry, but being a basketball head, I really kind of just pushed that to the side for the sake of being able to focus more on, you know, playing sports and, you know, nuance wasn't necessarily a word that we, we knew very well back in, you know, like 2006 through 2010. Um, and then, uh, but it was really in college that, that poetry became, or like poetry and artistry really became like on the forefront of my conscious. Um, and it was really just a, a place for me to escape, a place that I enjoyed being able to share who I was authentically. Um, so yeah, I would say that's the, those it's, it wasn't in like one that found out that I was genuinely an artist, but instead, um, in these smaller moments over the course of time that revealed themselves. So. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Brandon. Um, Brandon, you're a new father. Congratulations. Um, the world your daughter will grow up in is, uh, definitely different than the one that we've grown up in. Um, and I'm, I've noted that much of your work centers around the importance of positive communities, particularly when it comes to youth and upbringing. How do we maintain the same positive support systems online and in the digital space? And what do you see or wish for your daughter? The digital space is one that we can't avoid. Like it's, it's, one, it's a part of our educational process and educational systems is part of any job that people are going into and what you have to interact with and be able to do. So it's not something that, you know, we can just kind of 
shake our fingers at and say, no, no, no type of a thing. We have to really embrace the fact that that's a part of our world now. Um, but I think, I think if, I think, I think if youth come to the digital realm with a discerning mind, it'll really aid them in the process of being able to utilize it well, because, you know, our social media platforms come with so much information as well as so much misinformation, you know, memes with quote unquote statistics on them that need to be fact checked and proven. Um, so I think if, I think if youth take the opportunity to be able to really utilize the world wide web and it's massive amount of resource to be able to, um, seek out, uh, seek out objectively true information. Um, then they'll be so much more embittered and emboldened by its by its presence in our world. Um, but I I guess the other part of that too is um, I can be a lot of pressure for people to try to fit into these boxes or whatever on social medias. And so, like I I also hope that it that the World Wide Web is not just an information location, but a true source of community for some people. Um, to not just keep it online, but to also bring it into the physical world and be them their genuine selves and not just have to put up a front for everybody else. Yeah, following on that, um, there are a lot of, unfortunately, intimidating words and concepts floating around the digital conversation today. Deep fakes, drone surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. In an ideal world, what would our relationship with the internet look like? The internet should be a free space for people to be able to to be able to share thoughts, ideas. It should it should be a a world in which people can find community in the healthiest sense in almost any regard, um, and uh, it should be very much what what we've strived for our world to be a, a place in which it's open. Um, but I, I don't necessarily know what the online community looks like outside of that, because there have to be parameters to ensure the safety and well-being of others. Um, and so privacy is very important. Um, so I, I guess in that regard, I would say that the internet has to become a place in which uh, can be a reflection of the the, in, the bettering of society. Very good, very good. Last question, um, as we are getting close to our time here. Um, from both your art and our conversation today, we can glean that your neighborhood and upbringing involved violence. I'd love to hear how technology intersected with your life growing up, and whether you feel it exacerbated the instability, or was it more of a refuge? And I grew up dial-up where you couldn't be on the phone uh, while you try to be on the internet. Um, cell phones the size of bricks. Uh, I remember when cell phones started getting smaller, and then all of a sudden everybody wanted a huge touchscreen cell phone, like midway through the 2010s. Um, but I think technology impacted my neighborhood in an interesting way because um, technology was utilized to be able to lock up and put away a lot of people who were just trying to survive. Um, and it was used to survey and, um, and demonize my community now being able to redeem and self guard in which we utilize technology for the sake of our well-being and the sake of accountability with the very people who are utilizing it to to then vilify us so it's a double-edged sword that we're now beginning to to get a better grasp of hmm. so both uh serve to further instability but also a refuge and I remember those dial connections and the bricks that we used to carry around. <laughs> I remember that very well. Um, well, Brandon, thank you so much. Um, we now have the pleasure of turning to Mr. Ethiopis Tafara, Vice President and Chief Risk Legal and Administrative Officer at MEGA. 
uh, for closing remarks. Ethiopus, thank you so much for taking time to be with us here today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Ethiopia Safara, and I'm the Vice President for Risk Legal and Administrative Officer of MIGA. And it's really a pleasure to join this event today. Uh, I have to say, uh, it would be an understatement to say that this is unlike uh, any Zoom call uh, I've been on recently, and really a welcome opportunity to reflect. reflect. Um, but in all seriousness, we've heard some very powerful themes here today, uh, shared with us in a really incredible, powerful, and personal manner. Um, themes of identity, uh, the challenges in Brandon's life and his community, uh, the challenges in our country and, and in our world, and the challenges of social justice and, and continued racial issues, but also the power of achieving one's personal journey, uh, of realizing and self-actualizing, of what can be accomplished by pursuing and living our dreams. In introducing the poem Mosaic, uh, Brandon challenges the notion of our society and culture being a great melting pot where everything blends together to form uh, a single identity. And I think the concept of a mosaic better captures diversity as it creates an image without losing the distinction of all of its individual pieces. And I think it's important to remember that diversity is really about humanity. Uh, and in this, I'm personally guided by the words of uh, the famous philosopher and somebody I admire enormously, uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah, when he says, I am human and I think nothing human, alien to me. Um, finally, as part of this uh, day, we've been able in this presentation, we've been able to enjoy this experience uh, on data privacy. Um, Brandon has been able to share a fresh lens through which we can all consider data privacy, privacy of our information as digital media, privacy considering how and where we can share our personal data, and to consider how data sharing becomes increasingly intertwined in, in our lives. This is an important reminder that the manner in which we share our data can have an impact on what we can do later. We've just discussed the impact that this can have in the context of today's youth, uh, who we need to guide and protect in this new frontier. But it also applies to all of us across generations. We must consider the tough balance between privacy and expression, between sharing and protecting, and, and we must understand it in order to protect ourselves uh, and each other. The World Bank Group collects huge volumes of personal data to carry out our development mandate and to serve our twin goals of reducing poverty and boosting shared prosperity. We have a responsibility in our professional capacity, but also as members of our global development community and as engaged citizens. Um, in closing, uh, I'd like to thank Brandon uh, for a powerful uh, and thought-provoking performance. And Brandon, we should have a separate conversation. I'll try to hook you up with some good Ethiopian food. Uh, Sandy and Tammy for leading an engaging discussion with Brandon, and also to the DPO offices and teams across the World Bank Group who collaborated together and have worked to make this uh, a successful day. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, thank you to those watching for your participation in today's event. I hope that you found it engaging, I hope you found it informative and thought-provoking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ethiopus. Um, the wonderful words, as usual, from you. Um, Brandon, thank you, thank you, thank you um, for the work that you do, the art that you bring to the world. Um, I think that highlighting the, the use of personal data in, um, in these ways uh, helps to broaden the conversation. And as Sandy mentioned, um, art can bring uh, different views and different understandings of what we as humans experience. So thank you for uh, for your work. I'll give uh, a plug for you. Um, you can find Brandon's work on YouTube. Um, highly recommend that you take a look um, and also um, look at his, his website and his organization. Um, so thank you very much. Um, it was a, an honor to have you here. We look forward to meeting you again, hopefully in person someday. 
Um, and as Sandy said, we will uh, watch for the Pookie sweatshirt to be um, a, a hot item in the near future. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of, of your day.